I think we can all agree those were rather distinctive passages to read for scripture, and you're wondering how they're going to apply to the Christmas season. Hopefully when I get done, you won't wonder. Let's uh, read from Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 39. Now at this time Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. And thus for the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord God, as we open your word this morning and consider it, we pray that it would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. My message today is the third installment in our Advent series on the first two, ta- two, chapters, two chapters in Luke's Gospel. In the first segment, Daniel covered the announcement of the angel Gabriel to Zacharias that his wife would bear a son despite her old age, and that this would not be an ordinary son, but the prophet herald of the coming Messiah. Last week, Mike covered the section where the same angel, Gabriel, announces to Mary that she will bear a son, not in her old age, but in her youth. And this too would be no ordinary son. She would bear the Messiah. Zacharias responded not with faith, but with unbelief, and couldn't talk for the next nine months for his trouble. Mary, asking nearly the identical question that Zacharias asked, responded not with unbelief, but with wonder. The portion I get to cover today is divided into two sections. The first section is the interaction between Mary and Elizabeth, both of whom are pregnant. The second section is Mary's song of praise. This song has been known throughout history as the Magnificat because that's its first word in the Latin translation. In her song, Mary praises God for his great acts of salvation in the past, the present, and in the future. She is blessed because she believes. So this message today is really about faith. First, faith must have the correct object, God. Next, true faith in the one God will always be in God's promises, knowing that God never abandons his people. And finally, faith that believes God and his promises for his people will bring forth great acts, great deeds for God. Verse 39, the first verse I read, supplies the setting of today's passage, kind of like the opening instructions in a play. Before we hear the opening line in Richard III, now is the winter of our discontent, we are told first that the setting is London, 
near the Tower of London. And of course, if you know history, you know that that plays out in, in the play and in history. Our text today could easily say, just like in a play, in the hill country, enter Mary and Elizabeth. Where is the hill country of Judah, you ask? South of Jerusalem. It's referred to in Joshua 20 and 21 when the cities of the Levites and the cities of refuge are being established among the various tribes. According to Joshua, the city of refuge that was set up in Judah was in the hill country and was called Hebron. Although the specific city where Elizabeth and Zacharias resided is not mentioned here in Luke's gospel, it is likely to be Hebron. That means Mary, a girl of 13 to 15, traveled 80 miles, roughly, to visit Elizabeth. If you look on a map, if you look on a map, Hebron is in the southern part of Israel, and Nazareth, where she was from, is in the northern part. Luke does not mention her mode of transportation, but it was most likely on foot, right? I mean, they didn't just call up their Tesla and drive down there. So that is roughly the same as Lydia today, our Lydia, walking to Topeka. And this is no business as usual visit between Mary and Elizabeth. During their interaction, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy at the sound of Mary's voice. We are all familiar with baby's movements in the womb. The mothers here know it intimately. The fathers and the children know it by touch and by sight. It is the usual way with babies. In fact, it is a big worry if the babies are not kicking the mother. But this was no ordinary baby kicking that was going on. The scripture records that the Holy Spirit caused this jumping by the baby who will, who will be John, obviously. In fact, the word for it is the same one used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for Jacob and Esau wrestling within their mother's womb. So this is not ordinary kicking. What happens in utero is truly a miracle, but this kicking, is, this leaping is even more miraculous. John, the future baptizer, was excited to hear the voice of Jesus' mother, and he leaps for joy. Elizabeth does not respond by crying out in pain. She does not respond by telling Mary how blessed her own child is. Rather, she pronounces Mary blessed and the child in her womb, in Mary's womb, blessed. When a person stands in the presence of God, there is no thought of anything but God, even if God is in utero. Elizabeth then expresses amazement that the mother of her Lord should come to see her. We must linger on this verse, verse 43, for a moment. In normal human interaction, we would have expected the focus to be on Elizabeth. After all, she'd been waiting for a child for years. Yet here's this young girl, not even married yet, and we're not even going to talk about the social implications of that. But here's this young girl coming to visit her, and the focus is on the girl's baby, not her own. Elizabeth did not know that Mary was pregnant when Mary walked through her door. The Holy Spirit had to reveal it to her. Elizabeth could not have known what the angel had said to Mary, could not have known that the baby was the Messiah without the revelation of the Holy Spirit. But Elizabeth knows instantaneously that her Lord and her God has come to her. Her question, should the mother of my Lord come to me, prefigures what John, her baby, would say to Jesus when Jesus comes to him to be baptized. In Matthew 3.14, John says to Jesus, I have need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Now, Jesus is not mentioned by name in the passage today, but make no mistake, he is still the point of this story. Elizabeth understands this. Mary, later calling the child her Savior also understands this. I'm going to be talking a lot about Mary today, but do not forget, Jesus is the actual focus here. Mary and Elizabeth understand this, and so should we. We must keep our eyes focused on what is the point and not on what is not the point. Jesus is the point of the story, but the story could be used to push other agendas and has. 
other narratives, as we say nowadays. Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord in verse 43. This phrase has been used to elevate Mary to her exalted godlike status in the Roman church. Instead of the Lord Jesus still in fetal form being the focus of the story, Mary becomes the point. The focus is on Mary, not on the child. How did this come about, you ask? Well, in the 4th and 5th centuries A.D., there were lots of Christological disputes. There was the basic theological question of how, God, how Jesus could be both God and man at the same time. The correct formula, of course, is that Jesus is two natures. Christ is two natures, true God and yet true man as well, in one person. Two natures in one person. Without mixture or confounding, as the Athanasian Creed says. But it took a lot of fighting to get to that juncture. And one of the arguments for Jesus' true humanity was that Mary is called the mother of, of Elizabeth's Lord. She's also called the mother of Jesus in a few other places in the New Testament. To be fully human, obviously, one must have a mother. But Mary the mother became the point, not Jesus the child. Mary went from the mother of my Lord to the mother of God. It wasn't much after that that Mary was taken to have perpetual virginity. And because Jesus was sinless, Mary was considered sinless as well. From there, Mary was said to not have died, but to have been taken up into heaven at the Assumption. Now, Mary has been referred to as another member of the Trinity. Does that mean it's the Quadrinity now? That would be funny, except it's not. This, despite Mary calling the baby her Savior a few verses later. If Mary was sinless, she wouldn't need a Savior, now would she? And all of this arose because the church had to emphasize that Jesus was indeed human as well as divine. Jesus is the point, not the Mary. Not Mary, not the Mary. Not Mary. Worship belongs to God, not to any man or woman. Prayer is directed to God, not to any man or woman. Faith must have the true God as its object. Mary is called blessed because she believes, but she is only, be she's only blessed if she believes correctly. There is no blessing for having faith in the wrong thing. People in our culture often express faith. For a culture that's so concerned only for the material world, for the world that we can see and touch and smell and hear, there's really a lot of faith going on. Often it's just a nebulous thing. Have faith, we're told. When there is trouble, people are told to have faith. But faith in what? Faith in and of itself does not help anything. Faith has to have the correct object, the true God. Or you'll hear it said that one must have faith in oneself. I believed in myself. You hear this all the time in sports interviews. I had faith in myself that I could make that shot. Or my teammates had faith in me and kept throwing me the ball. Faith in yourself or in any other object is not faith. It's idolatry. And there is no blessing for idolatry. There is only punishment. The Shorter Catechism, com commenting on the First Commandment, said that God is much displeased with the sin of having any other God besides him. The world is full of wrong faith, whether it's Mother Earth or ourselves or poor representations of the true God like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Or of Mary. Mary is blessed because she believes God, that she is carrying God incarnate as her child. She is not blessed for her own sake. But the church 1,500 years ago did not start out worshiping Mary. It started out by calling her the mother of God to prove that Jesus was divine. Then she became sinless in the eyes of church, of the church. Wrong theology is often subtle. It doesn't start out as heresy, but that's where it ends up. We must be aware of false teachers. I'm sure you're all tired of hearing me say that. I've been saying that a lot lately. But it is a prominent part of New Testament teaching. We talked about it when we covered uh, Titus. It was certainly a theme in that letter. 
and in our membership series when we discussed the marks of a true church, this subject came up. A true church, true church must teach biblical doctrine. And if it doesn't, you need to steer clear of it. You need to run as fast as you can the other direction. Right now in American Christianity, there are numerous rumblings of false doctrine creeping into our churches. Or maybe they're not creeping. Maybe they're flooding. Nevertheless, when a church's main seminary starts saying that homosexual love is okay as long as one doesn't give in to its physical temptation, you know they are playing with fire. Or others are following the woke crowd, proclaiming that it is a sin to be white and you must repent of it. But even that does not absolve you of the sin. Just being born Caucasian, you are unsavable according to this doctrine. You have committed the unforgivable sin by being born. And churches are buying it. And of course, we in the reform camp are not immune to this either. Most reform denominations that are out there now started out as faithful churches, but they ended up in denying their Lord in one way or another. As Machen said, I did not leave the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church left me. We must be constantly on guard. So if you get tired of me hearing, say, of hearing me say it, that's why I keep saying it. So whenever you hear about Elizabeth calling Mary the mother of my Lord, remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is the correct object of that phrase, not Mary. And there are blessings in believing, but only if you believe the right things. Next, verse 45 in our passage today says this, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. We've already discussed the blessings of faith, as long as it's faith in the right thing. The next phrase shows that blessed faith believes the correct things. Not only does it require belief in the correct object, God, but it must believe the correct things about God. This is obviously a huge subject. We're not going to cover all of systematic theology today. I'm sure you're happy with that. Greg Bonson only did 80 lectures on Calvin's Institutes, so we would be here for a long time. But here, the thing that Mary is commended for believing is that there will be a fulfillment of what she has been told. Mary believed the promise of the angel and expresses in the Magnificat that she believes the promises of God. In the song, Mary expresses things about God. He is mighty, he is holy, he is merciful, he scatters the proud and exalts the lowly. At the end, she makes it clear that the blessing she received in burying the Messiah was a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and his seed forever, which is why we read the Old Testament passage we read. This is all about the promise to Abraham. In the passage in Genesis 17 that we read this morning, God promises Abraham that he will make a covenant with him, an everlasting covenant throughout all Abraham's generations, that Abraham will be the father of many nations, and the child, child will be Sarah's, even though Sarah is 90 years old at the time. In the Magnificat, Mary understands that what is happening to her is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. God keeps his promises. We can rely on that. Think of Mary's circumstances when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. She was a young girl, not yet married. She was living in a small town in a country occupied by a foreign power. And when we studied, when we studied uh, Mark, uh, oh, when we were doing the Bible study, Nazareth was not just a small town. It was a hovel. I mean, it was, yeah, it was... It was not a good place to grow up. But she was living in a small town in a country that was occupied by a foreign power. God had promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit the promised land and keep it forever. Yet at the birth of Christ, Rome controlled the promise, promised land. Mary was told by the angel that her child would occupy the throne of David forever. Yet the Roman emperor at the time, Caesar Augustus, would go down in history as Rome's greatest ruler. 
There is nothing to commend what is happening to Mary as the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, but it was. First, we can be confident that God will fulfill his promises. He did it all through the Old Testament for Israel, and then he brought them the Messiah. The Old Testament is full of examples of courageous people having faith in the true God and then seeing that faith worked out in time. In the New Testament, Jesus makes promises to his church that all the nations will be his disciples, that all his and our enemies will be brought under his feet, not through armed conflict, but by the preaching of the word. These latter promises are yet to be fulfilled fully, but they are just as sure as the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis and then fulfilled through Mary's child. Next, we need to think a little bit about time. I don't know about you, but when I read the scriptures, time kind of gets compressed together. And we must remember that for Mary, a day was 24 hours long, just like it is for us, and a year was 365 days long, just like it is for us. And consider this. The Exodus was approximately 1400 to 1500 B.C., and we know from Scripture that Jacob's family went down to Egypt 400 years before that. And the promise to Abraham was two generations prior to that. So if you do the math, Abraham was probably 2,000 years before Christ. That means that Mary was waiting for a promise to be fulfilled that was just about the same amount of time from her as she is from us. Think about that for a moment. God fulfilled his promise to provide a Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, to his people Israel. He does it in a way nobody expects, a, a, a king born in a stable with animals, who will rule a promised land, except that the promised land will no more be the area we now call Palestine. It will be the entire world. God fulfilled his promise through people no one would expect. He also does it at a time nobody could have anticipated. And his people, Israel, had been waiting for two millennia for this promised fulfillment. And then most of his people, Israel, missed it. I think this speaks directly to us. We Americans are an impatient people. Our nation rose to power in an incredibly short period of time, if you think about it historically, a mere 300 years. We have come to expect things fast. We like fast food. We like fast cars. We like fast internet. We want everything right now. How much of our problem as a church of Jesus Christ is related to this time factor? We've spoken about the theological drift that has gone on, but I wonder how much our impatience is also a factor. Come on, Lord, let's fix this problem now. There's important stuff that needs to happen, and there's a game to watch at 3 o'clock. Come on, let's do this. And then when God doesn't act in the way we think he should or on our timeline, it's easy to drift away. We have short attention spans. That is why I so appreciate our elder Daniel and his family. We were over at their house this, uh, this week, and we were talking about this. Not only is he positive about what God is doing here in Leavenworth, he and Sarah are constantly speaking about how what we're doing is for their great-grandchildren. Want to start a church with three families? No problem. We've got, we've got a couple centuries. Want to start a school with the same number? Okay, let's do it. Here we go. All of us as Christians need to keep both of these things in mind. God fulfills his promises. That is certain. He fulfills them in his way and on his timeline. That is also certain. It may not be certain to us, but it is nevertheless certain. It doesn't matter what President Biden is doing. It doesn't matter what Governor Kelly is doing. Those people are just tools in God's hand to work out his purposes. And he will still be working out his purposes long after Biden and Kelly are long forgotten. What else does Mary believe about God in this passage? She rejoices that God is her savior. 
Matthew chapter 1 tells us that Mary knew the child within her would be that savior. Her husband-to-be, Joseph, is told her there in Matthew 1, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We always tend to think of this in a spiritual way, that the salvation we need is from our sins. And of course, that is true. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again for our justification. The need of the human race is for salvation from sin. It was for that, and it still is. Always has been since the fall and always will be until Christ returns in glory. But Mary in the Magnificat expresses the physical ways this salvation will be worked out. She will be called blessed by all generations because she bore the Christ child. God's mighty act of salvation through Jesus Christ includes scattering the proud, bringing down rulers, exalting the humble. Those are all physical things. We American Christians are good at over-spiritualizing salvation. We think that Christ is our Savior, our sins are forgiven, and that is the end of it. Much of American Christianity has this Gnostic idea that as long as we are saved from our sins spiritually, it doesn't matter what else we do. Love God and do what you want, as the phrase says. Mary's song shows the lie to that. When we pray, thy kingdom come, what are we praying for? that God would scatter the proud, that he would bring down rulers that will not kiss the sun, that he would exalt the humble. That is how God is working out his promises to Abraham and his offspring forever. And by faith, we Christians are Abraham's offspring. We who believe that the child within Mary was and still is God the Savior. We are Abraham's offspring. There are spiritual blessings to being Abraham's offspring, but all through scripture we see that there are also physical blessings. Finally, Mary's actions show what happens when a person is blessed for believing God's word, that he will fulfill his promises. Belief in a great God and belief in God's great promises results in great acts of faith. What does Mary do? She goes to see Elizabeth. We've already discussed the geography of that a bit. We can just hear this. Goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, Dad. I'm going to walk to Judah. I'm going to go see Elizabeth for a few months. See you when I get back. Or maybe, based on Matthew's gospel, maybe she was married to Joseph at the time. Goodbye, Joseph. I'll be back. Which of us as parents would allow this? Goodbye, Lydia. Have fun on your walk to Topeka. And first century Palestine was no doubt an even more dangerous place for a young girl to be walking alone than 21st century Kansas is. And that's saying something. (laughs) Yet that is what Mary does. She goes to visit Elizabeth. Her next great act of faith is in burying the Christ child in Bethlehem after another long journey very near her due date. As ordered by Caesar, but in order to fulfill God's promise that the Messiah would be born in the city of David. Mary shows up in several other places in the New Testament. We read one of them this morning in our New Testament passage. Her faith doesn't seem so strong in some of those. In the Gospel of Luke, later, and we'll we'll, we'll cover this in a few weeks, when the 12-year-old Jesus stays behind at the temple, Mary rebukes him. Why have you treated this way, is what she says. But we can all hear the continuation of that. We've all been parents. We've all had parents. Why have you treated this way? After all we've done for you, we feed you, we clothe you, we provide shelter for you, and this is how you treat us. All of us have parents, as parents, have done that, and all of us that have had parents have heard that. Mary, apparently, for a brief moment in her worry, forgot what the angel Gabriel had told her about her son. Another time, recorded in Mark 3, which we did read this morning, she stood outside a house where Jesus was teaching, trying to take him away. He was disputing with the Jewish authorities, and his family thought he had lost his mind. His family was more in line with the Pharisees than they were with the, with the Savior. And again, Mary knew that this was the Savior. 
There is no way to interpret these acts except as acts of unbelief. But at the end, Mary stands at the foot of the cross where her son was being crucified. Jesus told her from the cross to love John as her son, and John was told to take care of her as his mother. While she is watching her son, her savior, die on a cruel, brutal Roman cross. Like so many other examples in scripture, we see Mary with great faith, and we see her in great unbelief. We see acts of faith mingled with acts of sin. We see that in Jacob. We see it in Jacob's sons. We certainly see it in David, the man after God's own heart. But in the end, like the saints of the Old Testament, Mary is saved, both spiritually and physically. Her final recorded act of faith, standing beneath her Savior's cross, shows that her previous sin had been forgiven. And becoming part of John's household, her physical needs were going to be taken care of in her old age. What does all this mean for us? How should we then live, as Mike asked last week, quoting Francis Schaeffer's famous book? Well, first of all, we have to worship the right God. Faith has to be in the right things, and that is God, the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Next, we have to believe that he is a promise-keeping God. He has promised his people salvation, and he will be faithful to that promise. He already has in the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus has promised us that of those given to him by the Father, not a single one will be snatched out of his hand. Our salvation cannot be lost. God has also promised to be a God to us and to our children. There's, that is a great comfort to those of us that have wayward children or to those of us that have children that are trying to go wayward. We believe God that he will keep his promises even while acknowledging that it will be in his time and in his way. Amen. We believe God when he says that he has given the entire world to Jesus and that all Jesus needs to do is ask it as it says in Psalm 2, verse 8. That means Jesus will ultimately be triumphant over all the world, over all the perverse generations, as the apostles referred to theirs. And they hadn't seen ours. It doesn't matter how the world looks. It doesn't matter if the world seems to be going insane. God is in control, and someday the government, all the government, will be on Jesus' shoulders, and it will be fully realized as is, as is promised in the book of Isaiah. We can also take instruction from the life of Mary. Like all the Old Testament saints, and like all of us, she was full of faith and full of unbelief. When we are being truly honest with ourselves, we know that we are like the man in the Gospel of Mark. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We can take refuge in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords no matter how deeply, deeply we've messed up our lives, no matter how deep we are in sin, with repentance there is always the promise of forgiveness. God promises to forgive us just as it was evident that Mary was forgiven. And God promises to use our lives for his kingdom just as he used Mary's. We stand in a long line of faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ. Not only do we stand in the line of Old Testament saints, we stand in the line of saints since the time of Christ. Some have accomplished great things, like the apostles and the reformers. Some have accomplished great things by being martyred, like Stephen and most of the apostles, and Huss and Latimer and Ridley. Most of the line of saints, though, have accomplished great things for God just by doing their ordinary duties like Mary having a, ba a baby, like Mary raising the Jesus as a boy, like Mary standing at the foot of the cross. For ultimately, we all stand at the foot of Jesus' cross. Amen. We either bow to him or we, malign, or we malign him. But we also stand at his empty tomb, where Almighty God conquered death. Joe Biden doesn't scare us. China and its viruses don't scare us. Critical social justice doesn't scare us. Build back better does not scare us. If God is for us, 
who can be against us. That is the promise of God. And like Mary, we are blessed when we believe it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your promises and that they are fulfilled through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray to have the faith of Mary, the faith that only you can grant, and that by that faith we might be more conformed to the image of our Savior Jesus. And now we pray the words that he taught his disciples, saying...